If you don't have your Bibles, would you turn with me to the book of Luke? Yes, sir. Luke chapter 9, verses 27 through 36. Luke chapter 9, 27 through 36. But I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God. Now about eight days after these sayings, he took with him, he being Jesus, took with him Peter and John and James, and went up to the mountain to pray. And as he was praying, the, the appearance of his face was altered, and his clothing became dazzling white. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish in Jerusalem. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep, but when they became fully awake, they saw his glory and the two men who stood with him. And as these men were parted from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we are here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. Verse 34, as he was saying these things, a cloud came from heaven and overshadowed them, and they were afraid as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. And when the voice had spoken, Jesus was found alone, and they kept silent and told no one in those days anything of what they had seen. The section of Scripture is often called the Transfiguration. When Jesus, his, his whole appearance was changed into his glorious appearance, his face, his countenance was beautiful, it was changed, his clothing was changed. Moses and Elijah come down from heaven, this cloud comes down. God says, here is my son with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. And I think it's so fitting that on the first Sunday that we're here in this library, in, in this auditorium, we're talking about the, the glory of God coming down and changing things. And that's my prayer for this place, as I prayed earlier, that let the glory of God come down and change things. And, and, and if you're thinking, well, we're in a library and there's books here that are evil, and there are, there's evil books here, and there's filthy books here, and there's holy books here, and there's children's books here, and there's all sorts of books and DVDs and all sorts of things, and bad things happen here, and good things happen here. And if you're thinking because of that, that maybe this shouldn't be a place where we're praying that God's glory changes, then I would rebuke you and say, I want God to change everything about this city, not just the library, amen? I want his glory to come down, and I want it to be seen in the library. I want it to be seen in Quaker Oats, in General Mills. I want it to be seen along the river. I want it to be seen in Wellington Heights. I want it to be seen on the northwest side, and the southwest side, and whatever side, wherever they are. I can never figure it out. <laughs> Everybody says different things about which side is which. But I want his glory to be seen in this city. Amen? But there's something important about the glory of God, and that's what I want to focus on today. When we talk about the glory of God, is that if you're not careful, you'll miss it. I think that's the moral of the story here that we just read. If you're not careful, you'll miss it. Could you pull out that title slide for me? Today's sermon is twofold. It's about listening, and it's about experiencing the glory of God. God. The name of the sermon this morning, listen to him in all his glory. Listen to him in all his glory. Luke 9, verse 27, but I tell you truly, there are some standing here who will not die until they see the kingdom of God. You know, some theologians struggle with this verse because they think, well, is Jesus talking about coming back? And if you remember, uh, two weeks ago, we were talking about Jesus telling us to take up our cross, talking about his own death and his own resurrection, and he has to suffer at the hands of men. And then he says, after all this about his death and his suffering and his resurrection that's to come, he says, some of you are going to experience the kingdom of God. And then the very next thing that happens is the transfiguration. And I think that the transfiguration was the first physical manifestation that those disciples saw of the kingdom of God coming down. Because my belief is that we don't need to wait for Jesus to return for the kingdom of God to be here on earth. Jesus' prayer, thy kingdom come. Right? 
Your kingdom come, Father. He prayed it did. He doesn't know when he's coming back. He, he knows it's going to be a while, but he, he doesn't know the day or the hour. And he says, whatever it is, your kingdom come. I believe his kingdom is here when we allow God's glory to shine through us, when we live in his word and we walk out when he tells us to walk out and we realize that Jesus lives inside of us and we don't have to wait until we die to be in the kingdom of God. Your kingdom come, Father. So he brings up the disciples up the mountain. And on that mountain, someone got an ESPN alert. You don't even use your phones. <laughs> Luke 9, 30 through 31. And behold, two men were talking with him, Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of his departure, which he was about to accomplish at Jerusalem. I just want to point out something marvelous about this verse that maybe you missed. Um, it's really hard to point things out with the screen way up there. Um, like, massive. Uh, but I'll, I want to try, I'll try here. Let me try to point this, point this out somewhere on that screen. They were talking about something. Moses... Elijah and Jesus, they were talking about something. What were they talking about? They were talking about Jesus' death, his resurrection, and him being ascended into heaven. Some don't even say departure. Some, some versions will say death. Some say destruction. Some say exodus. I believe the King James Version says they were speaking about his exodus. But what's so cool about this is that they were talking about Jesus' death not as if it was a negative thing to be feared or to flee from, but they were talking about it as if it was something to be accomplished. You see that? Moses and Elijah, who appeared in glory and spoke of Jesus' departure, which he was about to accomplish. It was an accomplishment that Jesus died and rose again. Was it heartbreaking that our sin was so horrible that Jesus had to die? Absolutely. It's terrible that our sin was so black and so stained that we needed God's only begotten Son to die for us. But nonetheless, Jesus accomplished it. Hallelujah. Listen to him. Listen to him. Father, as we give this message, I pray that we would listen to what your Holy Spirit is saying to us. Father, we listen to your word. Holy Spirit, speak clearly today. Speak through me and hear our behalf. Point one this morning. Listen, listening is a discipline. Listen, listening is a discipline. When we look at this story, all right, we've looked at the good stuff. We've looked at the accomplishment of Jesus. We've looked at the glory of him coming down. Just here in the introduction. What I want to focus on is, is how the disciples missed it. Because we are so much like the disciples, aren't we? Right? Come on. We're like the disciples. We're human. We're following Jesus, and we mess up sometimes, don't we? And the beauty of Scripture in reading about what the disciples messed up is it helps us to learn so that, when, so that we can grow. As they're messing up, we can look and say, let's make sure we don't have that kind of mess up, right? It's pretty simple. Learn from their mistakes. So I kind of want to focus on their mistakes this morning. Listening is a discipline. In this story, we see two undisciplined things happening. With the disciples. Two undisciplined things happening in the story that kind of help the disciples miss out on some of the glory of God. First, we see the flesh nature, the human nature. The, the, the disciples, they, they're human, they have flesh, they, they have a, a, a wicked and deceitful heart that needs to be renewed and restored and created clean and new. And the flesh sometimes fights against the spiritual, does it? Doesn't it? Luke 9, verse 32. Now Peter and those who were with him were heavy with sleep. But when they became fully awake, they saw his glory. They were heavy with sleep. They were tired. I think it's really interesting that, that Scripture includes this bit. Why does it say they were heavy? Why do we need that part of the story? Because I, I just think it's the truth that our flesh just looks at ways to rebel against spiritual things. There's another time in which the disciples were sleeping. Y'all remember when it was? In the garden, right? Two of the most important times in history, in the history of the whole existence of the universe, two of the most important times, and they were dozing off. Isn't that crazy? They're going up to the mountain. 
and here's Jesus and Moses and Elijah. And they're like, oh, oh Moses? Right? They're, they're dozing up. We look at uh, uh, Matthew 26, 40 through 41. They're, they're in the garden. They just had Passover. They know Jesus is about to be betrayed. They know Judas is about to do it because Jesus called them out at dinner. And, and they're in the garden, and they know it's crazy things are happening. Jesus is praying so hard, he is so passionate, that he is sweating drops of blood. Matthew 26, verse 40 through 41. And he came to the disciples and found them sleeping. And he said to Peter, couldn't you just watch with me one hour? Watch and pray that you may not enter to temptation. Look at this, I love this. The spirit indeed is willing. But the, fleet, the flesh is weak. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. What does this tell us? What does it show us? It shows us that we're weak. At least our flesh is. Our spirit is willing, but our flesh is weak. Our spirit says, yes, pray, intercede, war. Our flesh says, roll over, hit the, the, the snooze button one more time, have another nap. I know I'm not the only one with some weak flesh, amen? Come on. I know my flesh is weak when I'm walking back from the table from my third trip to the dessert pizza at Pizza Ranch. <laughs> Ain't nobody need eight slices of dessert pizza, especially after they've already had their fill of regular pizza. Dude, but my flesh is weak and that cat is bread. Just talk to me. I know it's wrong, but oh. Right? I know my flesh is weak. When, when, when I'm driving by Taco Bell and I have to fight with myself whether I'm going to stop or not. Maybe y'all have never done this before, but I've had a sad lunch before. Like I brought lunch and saw Taco Bell and just been like, nah, I'll put lunch away. It's good <laughs> my flesh is weak. I know my flesh is weak. When I wake up in the morning and I know what I'm supposed to do is get out of bed and pray over my wife and pray over my children and pray over this church and pray over this city and I need to get to the Word and I need to talk to God and I know all of this is supposed to happen but my bed is just so darn comfortable. And I think, man, maybe just, I'll just, I'll do it tomorrow. I just, let me just sleep in just a little bit longer. And then the Lord laughs at me and has one of our kids wake up. <laughs> so what do we do in the face of weakness in our flesh? What do we do? There's two options. When we're looking at weak flesh, there's two options. We either get disciplined or we get fat and lazy. That's our two options, right? Yeah. We either get disciplined or we get fat and lazy. If you eat Taco Bell every day, you are not going to be a fit person, right? If you eat Pizza Ranch every day, you're not going to be a fit person. And if you neglect your spirit for the comforts of this world, you are going to be spiritually fat and lazy. You better watch out before you die from some spiritual diabetes. America's got some spiritual diabetes, I'm telling y'all. You love that sweet, you love that sugar. That spiritual sugar, mm, it's good. <laughs> Get something a little meaty, and we're like, oh, that's too hard to digest. Give me that sugar. <laughs> First Corinthians 9, 24 through 27. Did you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one receives the prize? So run that you may obtain it. What's he saying? He's saying skip spiritual Taco Bell and get to the spiritual gym so that you know how to run. So that you can maintain, so that you can have energy, so that you can be fit. Every athlete exercises self-control in all things. They do it to receive a perishable wreath. Not, or they do it, they do it to receive a perishable wreath, but we do it to receive an imperishable, an eternal reward. Verse 26. So I don't run aimlessly, I don't box as one boxing the air. But I discipline my body and I keep it under control. At least after preaching to others, I myself should be disqualified. Some people act like spiritual self-control somehow means that you are neglecting the Holy Spirit. I've seen this happen in the charismatic church before, and I think it's a problem that we have. We're like, oh, you're in control. You're, you're, you're limiting the Holy Spirit.
Holy Spirit. You just need to just, just blah, just be a blah, and let the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, no, self-control is a fruit of the Spirit. Yeah. It takes self-control to wake up out of bed and to get to your word. It takes self-control to not pull out Facebook and scroll for 40 minutes and instead to, to pray, to, to, to intercede. It takes self-control to fast. That's what Paul's saying. Paul's saying, look at people, look at athletes. They have self-control in all of their areas of their life and what they eat and how much they sleep and how they train and what they do with their bodies. And they do it to win something that's perishable. That's something that's going to fade away. But what we're chasing after is something eternal. How much more should we have self-control? How much more should we have spiritual discipline? Sleepiness was not the only lack of discipline that we see. Look at verse 33 from our main text this morning. Luke 9, 33. And as these men were parting from him, Peter said to Jesus, Master, it is good that we're here. Let us make three tents, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. Look at those last five words. Not knowing what he said. Not knowing what he said. Master, let us make three tents. Let us make three tents. We'll make you a tent, and we'll make Elijah a tent, and we'll make Moses a tent. He said that not knowing what he said. Do you know what not knowing what he said means? It's the scriptural way of saying he was being stupid. He said something dumb. He didn't realize that what he was saying was ridiculous. And God comes down in that moment and says, what are you doing? This is my son. Listen to him. Peter wasn't listening. Peter's life, scripturally, was marred with undisciplined moments, wasn't it? Jesus said, let me wash your feet. And he said, no, Lord, I'll never let you wash my feet. He says, if I don't wash your feet, you're not entering heaven. Peter goes, whoa, not my feet, but my whole body also. Come on, let's go. Right? right? Jesus says, Jesus says, I'm, I'm about to be delivered into the hands of men to die. Not, not, not today, Jesus. I'm not letting that happen. Je the Lord of all the universe just told you something. You about to argue with him? No, he won't, Jesus. Jesus says, I tell you the truth, you're going to deny me. I'll never deny you. I'll die before I deny you. How'd that work out, Peter? <laughs> that makes scripture, bro. <laughs> Peter's life was marked with undiscipline. And praise God, that, that does not mean that, that Peter was not a man of God. He was. Jesus built his church upon the rock. That is Peter. And Peter was just mildly, praise God, because I'm an undisciplined. And I say some stuff, and I do some stuff, and I think, oh, what did I say? What did I just do? And I praise God that that doesn't disqualify me, that God loves me enough to grow me. And this morning, what I want to tell you is maybe you're good at being disciplined with your mouth, but maybe, maybe your prayer life isn't all that disciplined. Maybe you're struggling with, with you see, here's the thing. Peter didn't lack zeal. Peter didn't lack passion for the Lord. That's, that much is for sure, amen? amen? It wasn't that Peter lacked zeal. He had all of this zeal, but it was undisciplined zeal. <laughs> Pastor Matt tells this story. Uh, I, I gotta stop talking so highly to Pastor Matt. It really loves him so much. Woo! I was talking to him on the phone the other day, and, and I was like, I was like, man, I don't know if I should put your picture on my mission board. He was like, why? He was like, half my church already listens to your sermons after they listen to mine. They see too. Pastor Matt tells the story. He said there was this kid on his, on his football team who was, who was just the fastest kid ever. He was in track, and he could run so fast. And he got on the football team. He just begged to be on the football team. But he never played football, and he didn't really understand the rules. But he was fast. And one day, they're like, fine, you know what? You're clearly fast. You're the fastest kid on the track team. We'll, we'll give you a handoff. Real game, they give him a handoff, and this kid took off. Fastest kid on the field. <laughs> Only problem was he ran to the wrong end zone. <laughs> it doesn't matter how much passion you have. It doesn't matter how much zeal you have. It doesn't matter how strong you are. It doesn't matter how fast you are. If you're not disciplined, if you're not pointing it in the right direction, you're going to miss something. Right? And here in this story, we see Peter missing the glory of God. I can just see he's, he's up there. 
let's build this tent, let's do this thing, let's, let's, let's get this together. And I could just see, like, God coming down from the cloud and being like, Peter, the adults are talking. <laughs> and, and, and it's true, though, and, and, and I'm about to turn this on, on us, so it won't be so funny, but... Uh, dude, it's so annoying. When my son, praise God, God is much more patient than I am. But when my son just comes up and I'm having a serious conversation with someone and I'm trying to pour out, I'm trying to minister, and, and, and Ezra just comes up, dad, 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 what do you want? Hulk is awesome. <laughs> they, they couldn't have waited? <laughs> decides to show Elijah some of his glory. But his glory wasn't in the avalanche, it wasn't in the earthquake, it wasn't in the wind, it wasn't in the fire, it wasn't in all of these booming, exciting, huge things. His glory was in the still, small place. How often have I missed 
missed the glory of God because I was so busy doing the things of God that I forgot to stop and be with God. And I think if I'm just on the front lines and if I'm just doing the battle and if I'm just there, then I'll see the glory of God. And God's saying, why didn't you just, before you went out, why didn't you just spend some time? You just listen to me. As I was preparing the sermon, the, the Lord gently rebuked me. Uh, oftentimes when I prepare a sermon, I prepare it in my head before I put anything down on paper. Or I'll go and I'll read the verses and I'll just kind of work things over in my head. And the Lord gently rebuked me. He spoke to me. He said, Christian, when's the last time you stopped and listened? I was like, hey, now, <laughs> I'm trying to preach. I ain't trying to grow. <laughs> He said, when's the last time you saw me? I said, Lord, I'm sorry. I've been working so hard these past couple of weeks that I've forgotten to just stop and be with you. And the Lord spoke to me. And you know, it's funny what he said. First, he, first he, he rebuked me about something in my life. And um, I'll just tell you what it is. Y'all know me. My life's not. Um, I was playing this video game that, um, it's not a horrible video game, but it's a mature rated video game, and it's called Dark Souls, and it's really difficult, and I really like the hard games, but it's super great. Uh, the Lord just spoke to me, and he was like, Christian, that game's filthy in my eyes. Stop that. And then, after that, he said, by the way, let me get you a promise. He said, just wait. The Lord gave me discipline, and he gave me promise, and it was one of the most beautiful times in my prayer life. And I went and I uninstalled that game, and it's fine, man. I've got like 500 other video games I can play. <laughs> it's, like, it's like 327. Oh. <laughs> but it was just so sweet. And you know what's crazy is... I think about that, and I think about that experience, and I think, how many more promises have I missed because I didn't give God the chance to speak to me? How many more areas does God want me to grow in, and I've missed it because I haven't just stopped and listened? John 10, verse 27, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. If you are a sheep of Christ, hear this church. If you're a sheep of Christ, you ought to be hearing his voice. My sheep hear my voice. But they don't just hear his voice, but they follow him. Point three this morning, very short point. Do what he says. A voice came out of the clouds saying, this is my son, my chosen one. Listen to him. Listen doesn't just mean hear what he says, it means do what he says. It means hear it, comprehend it, and then act upon that. When my son isn't listening, it's not that he's not hearing what I'm saying, it's that he is choosing to neglect to act upon what I'm saying. We have to do what Jesus says. What's the point if we don't? Luke 6, 46. Luke 6, 46. Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Why do you call me Lord, Lord, and do not do what I tell you? Church, you don't get the promises without the obedience. You don't get the promises without the obedience. Hebrews 12, verse 6. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. If you're not receiving discipline and chastisement from the Lord, if the Lord's not rebuking you and disciplining you and showing you areas of your life, I would be concerned about your spiritual relationship with him because scripture is so clear that he chastises the one he loves. If he 
loves you, he's going to rebuke you. Not because he wants you to feel bad. Not because he wants to condemn you. There's, there's no condemnation in Christ Jesus. But because he wants you to grow. I don't spank my son because I want him to cry. I spank my son because I want him to be an upright individual and a respectable young man. Because I know that the attitudes that he has now will translate into his adult life if they're not fixed. And so I want to fix them now so that he doesn't have to struggle with some of the things that I struggled with. Like running my mouth. Like not being able to submit to my bosses. Like, like saying disrespectful things and not even realizing that they were disrespectful. I don't want him to have to struggle with those kinds of things. Because at the end of the day, you know what? Here, let me just share something with you. This is something that I've been seeing going on. It's something that had a lot to do with this message, but I just feel like I need to share it. If you meet someone who's undisciplined in the way in which they behave, the way in which they speak, maybe they're mean, maybe they, they don't consider your emotions or others' emotions, maybe they're selfish, maybe they're rude. Can I tell you the secret about that person? That person probably has no idea the way they're making you feel. And they probably didn't have the best upbringing. Because they didn't have a parent to spank that out of them. Or to send them to time out when they need to go to time out or do whatever discipline they had. And if you have an experience with that kind of person, my encouragement with you is to have mercy on them. How hard it must be to live a kind of life where you push everybody away. And not even know why. Have mercy on them because God has mercy on us. He has mercy on us. So the Lord rebuked me and gave me a promise, and I am so grateful that he did because it showed me that he loves me, that he wants me to grow, and that he has good things in store for me. And if you listen to the Lord this morning and he shows you something in your life that is not up to his standard of holiness and perfection, don't be upset. Rejoice. Thank you, Father. The example that I always give as we close things down, and, and I'm, I'm concluding this message here, I uh, want to uh, give us some time to fellowship, give us the Lord some time to, to minister. But I'll give you this, this, uh, this example in conclusion. We're talking about the view from the Lord. Um, <clears throat> there's a big difference between a cop who pulls you over and gives you a ticket and a cop who pulls you over and gives you a warning, isn't there? <laughs> right? You know, what's interesting about those two scenarios, at least in my life, is both have the same result in regards to my speed. Right? From, my, from that point forward, if a cop pulls me over on a road, I will never speed on that road again because it is a traumatic event. I don't know about you all, but I hate getting pulled over. And I will always remember every single intersection, every single street that I got pulled over. Whether I get a warning or a ticket, the result's the same. The difference is on my pocketbook, right? <laughs> one costs money and one doesn't. Which would you rather have? Are you angry at the cop who gives you a warning? I hope not. I hope you're grateful. Because you broke the law, and yet instead of getting a punishment, you, you got a warning that says, hey, don't drive like this. We should be grateful to the Father who doesn't give us punishment, but gives us discipline. Right? The ticket for sin has an eternal payment. Right? When that ticket comes due, I don't want that for anyone. But God doesn't do that. When we listen and he says, hey, here's what's going on in your life, don't be angry at him. Be grateful. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for helping me grow to be more like you. And I find that he almost always will give you a promise along with that discipline. He'll give you a word of encouragement. He'll give you some love. John 10, verse 27. My sheep hear my voice. And I know them, and they follow. If you don't know his voice, it's for one of two reasons. Here's the takeaway, church. If you don't hear his voice, it's for one of two reasons. One, you're not one of the sheep. You 
you've not been truly saved, you've not been truly born again, you've come to church, you've done the things, but you've never really given it all to Jesus, or two, you're not listening. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. If you don't hear his voice, it's either because you're not his sheep or you're not listening. So let's take a moment before we leave this place to address both kinds of people because I think there's both kinds of people in the congregation in the church this morning. I've been person kind of two, person number two, plenty of times before. And before I was saved, I was person number one. 